hello everybody. Um, obviously, uh, greetings from Sweden. Um, so look, just a, a very quick introduction uh, and my, my journey, I guess, as to why kind of my journey actually up to where, where I'm standing here with you today. Um, so really my background is uh, obviously from the UK. I moved to Sweden four years ago, uh, which for me has been transformative both on a personal level and, and professionally. Um, one of my favourite festivals here in Sweden is the Crayfish Party, uh, in addition to uh, Midsummer, of course. Um, but Crayfish Party is amazing. I'm a pescatarian, so to be able to celebrate uh, this amazing seafood and also with schnapps, uh, what is there not to like? Um, I've got a thing for architecture. Uh, I, for probably in my late 30s, I realised, hey, hang on a minute, I really enjoy buildings and industrial and minimal particularly. And so I'm constantly taking photos of buildings in different landscapes and different backgrounds as shown here. Um, professionally, um, my background was, uh, I was very, very proud and very fortunate to start a recruitment company very early in my career, in my early 20s. And I went on the rocky roller coaster ride of, of running, growing and developing uh, a recruitment organization in the UK, specializing in customer contact, customer experience uh, and call centers. Um, and after 16 years, a uh, very, very long time, um, I decided to uh, yeah, exit the company and, and focus on something new. Uh, that took me on to my next passion in life, which is around experience, because I've always been very passionate about experiences, both how I design my business around experience, but also kind of what can I do around developing it further. So I went to work and worked with organizations to help design and also measure candidate experience. Uh, and this is an example of one of the dashboards from years ago. But it really, for me, what the learning I took from this was number one is I'm not a product development guy, um, but certainly using insights and listening to people um, to generate insights and improvements for organizations. And candidate experience, trust me, there's a huge, richer plethora of, of data and uh, insights and feeling available uh, right now in any organization and recruitment process. My curiosity for experience continued. Um, I really wanted to figure out like, how do you design an experience? What's some of the kind of methodologies that you, that you need from that perspective? And so the methodology I focus on, I, I went to Amsterdam and spent time at the Design Thinkers Academy. And after that boot camp, I left that place thinking, oh my God, this is the why I found my next passion in life. And I see the huge opportunity there is for organizations, particularly people functions, whether it's talent acquisition or HR, to really embrace and utilize this amazing problem to solving and methodology. And this really then sent me on a whole kind of channel. I've been doing running workshops, helping organizations reimagine uh, what that experience could look like here. Here we're co-creating a new and reimagining an onboarding experience um, in one of our workshops here in Stockholm. Finally, I have a podcast. Um, I've had that almost for two years now. And guess what? Guess what it's about? It's called The Experienced Designers. So I've had the likes of Lego, uh, Oodle was the, is my latest uh, podcast, uh, as well as McKinsey Design. And some, I've just met people, amazing people from all over the world. And far, last but by, by not, no, no means least, Five Studio is my latest venture. So last year, launched this as a, as a, a design consultancy based in the Nordics, working with customers across Europe, really focusing and helping companies use the power of design to create uh, employee experiences. So today, I'm here to talk to you about design thinking and employee experience, and they are genuinely the perfect match. And I think also I've got to be careful here because they're also two of the probably the biggest buzzwords out there right now. Um, but I'm really kind of, for the next 20 minutes, I really want to spend some time. I haven't got case studies, I haven't got statistics. All I want to do is just spend time with you to really ensure that out there that this kind of design thinking is that people understand exactly what it is and what it isn't. I think that's really, really important that we don't lose the essence of these, of these really innovative tools that are out there for people. And also employee experience. It's definitely on the uh, developing, um, I'm part of a global network of employee experience designers. And this discipline is definitely evolving without a shadow of a doubt. And I'm really glad we've actually got something now to, to focus on in amongst just employee engagement. Uh, which we've had for years and seemingly haven't really solved it. So the EX movement's happening uh, and there's some amazing uh, examples of that which I can share later. Also, of course, nothing, I mean, it was prominent in your, in your comments from the delegates, COVID-19, you know, we're all talking about this old and new normal, what it could look like. Uh, but one thing for sure is inertia is not our friend, is not the answer. You know, sitting back and waiting to see what happens. You know, for me, design can and will play a huge part in how we shape the future of work. So that's just kind of 
you know, designing the journey back to the office. You know, we can't just pull off the dust sheets after six months and expect to just carry on as we were. And we can't also just kind of make assumptions that this is what we think people need, want or desire. We have to actually design it around those needs and wants. So I think there's the journey back, but then also beyond that, how do we then work 50-50? How do we then design that specifically that ensures that we're supporting our, supporting our people and really ensure that we're kind of balancing the good for both our people and companies? So I just as we talk, to talk about it today, I just invite you to think about the wider application of design thinking as a way of problem solving some of your most complex challenges. And by the way, the more wicked the challenge, the better design thinking is. So look, first off, let's go a little bit abstract. Uh, design is absolutely everywhere, as you'd expect. Um, and look, no design-led presentation would be complete without mentioning Apple, of course. But they really were, for me, they, are the, they created an amazing peak peak moment in the CX journey, which was the kind of opening the box experience. And if you Google opening box experience, you'll see people sharing videos of when they're opening the box and anyone that's had one, you know, has one of these products, you know that experience is quite special when you take the initial plastic off and layer it and open it up. And this was intentionally designed as a peak moment in the, in the CX journey. And so for me, there are plenty of opportunities and learnings to use design to create these peak moments in the employee journey. Secondly, so when I found this image, for somebody who loves minimal, this my toes, my toes curls, curl at this one, just looking at it. Um, but as you can see, even in its prime, this lift was, you know, complicated. I mean, God forbid you kind of, you know, you, you were visually impaired. Um, you've got duplication, all these kind of things. And for me, this kind of inspiration for me is like, is this your application experience? Do candidates have to continually, uh, you know, input different information along the, along the application process, creating confusion? Of course, not the wellies of choice for Glastonbury, um, but I don't know about you, but I absolutely hate that feeling of wet socks and, and, and wet feet. Um, not a good feeling, but obviously a, a poor design, but could this be a representation of something causing discomfort for employees or impacting your business? And of course, really another strong theme in, the, in your feedback prior to the event was the diversity and inclusion. Could we really use design to help solve a particular set of challenges relating to some of the diversity and inclusion challenges that you face? And also finally, Braun, um, for me, Dieter Rams, if you're aware of him, uh, is one of my design icons, absolute genius. Um, and here, if you look at this, when I look at this, I was like, well, this is, you know, the products are amazing. Um, if you start to then look and think about it, and let's bring it into the context of, uh, of our world, it's, you know, each one, each product could specifically be supporting a specific employee, for an example. So let's say the shaver could be for your kind of experienced hires, the record player is for your graduates, and the radio is for your developers. But each, each one is very much centered and designed for. So when you look at the products, they're inherently brawn and that look and feel. So from our intentionally, again, you get the employer brand feel, but you've intentionally designed products or EX products specifically for those different audiences. And Dieter or Rams was, was famous for his quotes. For me, one of my favorite, uh, indifference towards people and the reality in which they live in actually uh, is actually the one and only sin in design. And I think also maybe change the word in design in, in business generally. But just wondering whether we, you know, for me, design is built on an intrinsic understanding of people fundamentally, which very much speaks into the, the following segment. So what is design thinking? So first one is it starts with you internally within yourself. So design thinking is a philosophy and a mindset. So a mindset that embraces things like empathy, optimism, iteration, creativity, and above anything else, ambiguity. The second thing is it's human centered. So whereas many processes for problem solving, there's many processes for problem solving, design thinking focuses specifically on the human centered side of creative problem solving. So it keeps people at the center of everything that you do. So everything that you're designing for. And, and if you, and, sorry, and you can arrive at optimal solutions that meet their needs, sorry. So co-creation. So design thinking centers on collaboration and co-creating solutions. So encouraging people from different departments, levels and skills offers opportunities to innovate across organizations. So this is really, for me, design thinking breaks silos, 
it seeks new and different perspectives really in when you're designing some of the solutions. And the last one is it's iterative. So design thinking is far from linear. It's a step-by-step -step project improvement pro or project improvement program. And for example, when you're kind of creating ideas or creating prototypes with people you're solving the problem for, you're then getting immediate feedback to refine very, very quickly before then spending lots of time developing solutions which people may not actually use or embed properly into your business. Well, first, before I carry on, let's just go back a little bit and delve into a little deeper into the mindset element for a moment. So last year, I had the absolute privilege of meeting Jean Liedka. Um, and Jean is an absolute legend in the design thinking uh, industry or field. Um, and um, she's based in the US. And one of the challenges, of course, with approaching anything new is shifting our own mindset first and foremost, but in particular also of others, and in particular senior leaders. And so she created an example persona called George. And George represents a, a kind of more fixed mindset prevalent in, in many organizations and, and no doubt resonates with people you've come across in your career. So George is, there's only one right answer. Um, being right equals being smart. Um, seeking proof, not possibility. Um, winning debates, not fostering dialogue. Um, threatened by the unknown. And numbers are more real than people. So just let that couple of those sink in. Maybe there's one or two points that perhaps you're smirking or anything and yet I know a few, a few of these people but they are prevalent and we need to kind of we need these are the people that we need to influence and convince that human-centered approach to problem solving offers more benefits and I'll come back to George a little bit later. The other challenge relates to how we previously solved problems in organizations and this is a this is a, 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 a framework I came across uh, many years ago but it's still really relevant even today just to hone the point around where design thinking sits the first one is when we think about problem solving in companies, we start off thinking like, okay, we need to build a transformation. And then we roll, develop our strategy and then we operationalize that strategy and what comes last, it hits the people. And so this kind of top down thinking, uh, which is obviously kind of systemic, it's hierarchical, um, design thinking works differently. It starts very much with people and then it works around how that works in an operational context. Then you build the strategy and then the transformation. And this is the post method, which it's been around for many years, but I think again, for the purpose of today, just hones in the point around the mindset of where you start to think about solving problems. So I'm gonna talk through the methodology. And the reason why I'm doing this is I want people to kind of walk away today, at least understanding what is design thinking, because there's a lot of stuff out there going on. Uh, there's a lot of content going out there and there's a lot of misgivings around um, really what it actually is and what it isn't. So I'm going to do a little step by step and um, just walk you through and then hopefully at the end you'll at least know when you're then engaging future content you're coming at it from a point of knowledge rather than assumptions. So the first methodology and there's, there's lots of kind of visualizations of this is the famous double diamond uh, and the double diamond is and for, for me it's, it's a more complex model than this. I've stripped it down for, for the purpose, sole purpose for me today is just to invite you to just basically the learning from this is it's a divergent and convergent thinking methodology it's all about opening up and and particularly as part of the initial phase is lots of research and opening up to all the possibilities so just putting your own assumptions and thoughts and ideas to one side and, and spend time with people or your or, or your target group and really diverging and listening and really opening up to all the possibilities and then the conversion is in bringing the, that knowledge back into a specific outcome and a focus area that you can then hang your hat on and say, actually, we've done our research and we know this is the priority. This is where we can impact the, the biggest difference. So the second slide visualization was produced by Stanford Design School. Um, and so there's five modes of work. So what we need to think of is each of these steps as modes of work. So we have empathize. We have define, we have ideate, we have prototype, and we have test. And under each of these five modes, there are a huge variety of toolkits available to use. So the exact exercises within each of these circles are not defined. And this is where, for me, the value of a designer brings to the table. So there's no set rules on which exercises or toolkits you use in each of these phases. And while I talk about toolkits for a moment, 
here's a great resource. So if you're curious and you want the most amazing resource for toolkits, so workshops, uh, different kind of workshops that you can engage with for different purposes or outcomes, then Toolbox Toolbox is the go-to resource. Um, it was founded by a lady here in Sweden. Um, and for me, it's, if you can imagine, it's a bit of a bad analogy, but it's like a Bob the Builder uh, where you've got the toolkit and you're looking at the context of the organization. You're thinking about what's the challenge what's the employee types, what kind of stakeholder characteristics, what kind of ideation or what kind of prototype do we want to build? And they're the tools you engage that obviously then do, do create the, the desired outcome. So it's all about contextualizing what that kind of is. I look at each company as a canvas and on that canvas is a, I mean, a myriad of different circumstances, individuals, egos, people, all these kind of myriad of things that you have to navigate and the toolkits help you navigate that. So let's go back to the methodology. I'll briefly walk you through this step by step. So the first one is empathize. So this is the foundation of design thinking at EX. So this is divergent thinking, putting your own assumptions, ideas, solutions, egos, any, anything else, kitchen sink to one side and understand the people you're trying to design for. So it's about perspective taking, who am I making it for? What is their problem? What, do, what does this user group want to do uh, uh, and do on a day-to-day -day basis and empathizing with the people you're designing for. The second one is define. So taking everything you've taken from research, making sense from the research and generate insights. So this is about convergent thinking. So define, breaking down, what are the user needs? What are the challenges? What some of the problems? What some of the insights? Um, and start to align and converge to a clear design criteria. And this is typically a reframe of a problem. Normally, in this situation, the problem that the customer normally has, the problem actually we come out at the end of this phase is very, very different or kind of in a different place to where we started out. And this is, that's always my advice and approach. Always, always fall in love with the problem. When you define the problem, fall in love with it. Tattoo it on your arm, do whatever you need to do, but fall in love with the problem. Don't fall in love with the solution uh, for, for, for something which you haven't truly defined yet. Third section is IDA. So this is about taking everything you've learned in the first two steps and coming up with solutions and ideas. So potential matches of products, services, and experiences and match them to the insights you've taken. So this is convergent thinking again. This is about a wide variety of qu and quantity of ideas and going beyond the first phase of ideas, going beyond the obvious ideas. It's really delving in. So building on each other's ideas, the group's ideas. So this area focuses very much on creativity and combining unconscious conscious with rational thought and imagination. Fourth one is prototype. So taking all of these ideas, breaking down into a select few, and then run them into simple testable prototypes. So this is, I mean, I've built stuff out of cardboard. Uh, we've done uh, Lego. We've done a variety, simple, cheap, rapid way to shape the ideas so that when you can then interact with them and then start to test them. And the important aspect here as well is the showcase the, pro the prototype in context. So people need to experience the situation, feel like they're in that situation to then be able to use the solution to then give you real time feedback. And that leads me on to the last one around test. So what you've created from three and four, taking your prototypes and testing it with real people. And I cannot stress this enough. When you're doing observations and you're doing the testing phase, just that in the moment reaction, in moment emotion, in action confusion, all these things feed back into then refining your prototype and moving it forward. So crucial, crucial element. And finally, once you've tested your prototype and gained feedback, here's an example that then from an iterative point of view, you test it. And in this situation, it might be that that particular prototype didn't work. However, the feedback gave you an indication that one of your other ideas actually could be better suited. So you go back to that idea, create the prototype and then test it again. And again, this could happen with a prototype that maybe worked really, really well and you received maybe some you know, little bits of feedback then to refine it further, it goes back into the prototype phase, refine, and then back to the test phase again. And again, these are different sections and different areas in which you can then move. So let's just go back to George and the opportunity. So with George and design thinking generally with this kind of process and methodology is, Back to George in terms of the influence and the impact. And actually, I would say George, in a kind of way, was kind of me a number of years ago. 
And actually design thinking has helped develop me as a person without a shadow of a doubt. And I'm not saying I'm particularly kind of egocentric, but some of the challenges or some of the kind of changes that we've observed with people is going, people go from egocentric to an empathic other focus. It goes from an overwhelmed by different perspectives into inspired and energized by deep insights into needs and people. And you're divided by difference to converging around what actually matters and bringing one right solution into the room to you know, co-creating higher order solutions together. And finally, abstract and ambiguous descriptions based on assumptions to really concrete, tangible and testable ideas. So on one last slide, couple of slides, the application to, e to EX, and this is why I, my mission with Five Studio is to really bring design thinking into the, into the people functions in organizations, mainly because it's about people and humans, so why not? <laughs> it's kind of, kind of makes sense. But for me, this thing works at any level of granularity. So for an example, if you want to reimagine your candidate experience or onboarding or engagement, you want to tackle an engagement challenge. If you want to redesign your exit or the alumni network or how you're developing your people, you could also get into granular piece around your application or an interview stage, or I've seen organizations at the moment getting a tremendous amount of efficiency in reimagining and redesigning the, um, the performance reviews. And that's gaining a tremendous amount of time savings for managers and employees, which when you then scale that up over a large organization, you know, an hour a week or an hour a month scale up over a thousand people, um, you've got some significant return on investment. And the lastly, this is a famous quote by Mark Levy, uh, who was, uh, well, I mean, if you don't know him, look him up. Uh, but he was the first person uh, uh, to basically go into Airbnb. His brief was to create a people function for Airbnb. And he basically deleted the words HR and created a people experience function. And he was quoted saying employee experience is about doing things with and for your employees, not to them. And I think that very much aligns into design thinking and human centered design. So just one last reflection for you, and this is taken from some of the questions that I took or some of the areas that we took from, uh, from, your, uh, from your own comments when you registered for the event. So what I decided to do is just take some of these and flip them into a design question. So for example, I use something called uh, a how might we method. So this is, uh, these, are lot, these are real uh, examples from taken from you, the audience. So how might we attract the most diverse workforce? How might we significantly improve our candidate journey through pre-boarding, onboarding during the global pandemic? How might we improve the candidate experience during the recruitment process? Whoever wrote that, please get in touch with me. I'm happy to share. Um, and finally, how might we shift our business to meet the new demands of our workforce after COVID? And thinking of now, thinking about design thinking, for me, every single one of those I get really excited about because they're opportunities to solve complex problems using design thinking. So thank you very much for your time. Best way to contact me is LinkedIn and there's my QR code for your leisure. Thank you.